First here at 5 o'clock, held up at gunpoint, then mowed down by a car. A Southeast Portland man is opening up about his harrowing early morning walk near the South Tabor neighborhood. The victim says his attackers knew what they were doing, and he fears it may happen again. Mike Benner reports. All I could think of was my wife. You know, I was like... They're going to kill me. She's going to be alone. Bob Wenberg is struggling to keep his emotions in check. Physically, he's not much better. And then yesterday, I tried to get up and I fell and we had to call the fire department and to come get me up. The 55-year-old has a broken leg, among other injuries, all of it stemming from a terrifying incident Sunday morning. This never would have happened five years ago. You know, it would never would have happened two or three years ago. Bob says he was walking his German Shepherd on Southeast Tibbets between 79th and 80th when a car pulled up alongside of him, almost brushing him. You know, the window was rolled down and there was this masked youth and he was pointing a gun right at me. And he like looked at me and said, give me your wallet, your phone and your dog. Bob was in absolute shock and fear, but he made the split second decision to make a run for it. That's when they accelerated. And then they, you know, I almost got you know, around it, but then they hit me and it flipped me over the hood. On the ground in excruciating pain, Bob thought the young guy with the gun would shoot him. Instead, he and his crew drove off. Bob was left yelling for help. And finally, I saw this homeless guy who was walking down the street. And I yelled at him, and he was actually the homeless guy who actually helped me. And I said, look, you got to you got to go get someone to call the you know, 911 for me. Bob, of course, filed a police report with the Portland Police Bureau. He tells us that officers told him this holdup could be connected to a much bigger crime spree throughout Portland. Well, that's really concerning. I mean, how how's anybody you know, what are you supposed to do? You think you're in a safe neighborhood? This is not a bad neighborhood. Yeah, it's definitely terrifying. Katie Blavelt lives across the street from where Bob encountered the gunman. She says she used to feel safe in the neighborhood. But now we're actually going to be moving um, because of these reasons. And it just doesn't feel safe having a four year old here anymore. Moving isn't out of the question for Bob and his wife either. But in the more immediate future, Bob's hoping police catch the bad guys. These were kids and they were they tried to murder me when I tried to run away. I mean, they tried to run me down in southeast Portland. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. That is just terrifying, and a spokesperson for the Portland Police Bureau tells us detectives are aware of this case and they are investigating. We're getting a better look now at the numbers behind the state vaccine mandates, and it's clear Oregon has been more willing to keep state workers in their jobs than Washington. Here's Tim Gordon. Two states with Democratic governors who have often followed each other's leads on managing the coronavirus pandemic. But not exactly when it comes to vaccine mandates and exemptions for state workers. We're going to throw some figures at you, but they prove the point. In Oregon, with more than 40,000 under the mandate, nearly 34,000 got vaccinated. And 11 percent, or nearly 4,300 people, got religious exemptions. In Oregon, an exemption means accommodations are made and you actually keep your job. But not so in Washington, where more than 63,000 are under a mandate. More than 56,000 proved vaccination, and about 7% got a religious exemption. But in Washington, only 3% were granted an accommodation to keep their job. So that is a big difference. Washington at 3%, Oregon at 11% for accommodating exemptions. That's 8% more state workers in Oregon staying employed. Professor Carlos Crespo is director of PSU School of Public Health. His take, whether state workers are accommodated or lose their jobs, as hard as that is, it accomplishes the same goal for public health. The expectation is that you are not going to put that person in harm ways. And therefore, you know, governors have to require that the people who represent the government are not harming or could potentially harm somebody else. But still, that's tough. Whether you're a fish and wildlife worker or a state trooper in Washington, getting an exemption does not equal employment. Now, here's another difference between states that may explain some of this. In Washington, exemption decisions are being made at the state human resource level. In Oregon, they are being made at the agency level with guidance provided from state HR to help understand what exemptions are and how people can qualify for them, trying to keep things fair. Like it or not, COVID vaccinations have become highly charged and, yes, a political issue. And for public health leaders like Professor Crespo, that's too bad. 
and it carries on in 2021. Tim Gordon, KGW News. While many state employees are going on unpaid leave due to the mandate, school districts in southern Oregon are granting hundreds of employee exemptions. A lot of the exemptions were for religious reasons. Medford School District says 18 percent of its staff, that's 283 people, were approved. Grants Pass School District says 21 percent of its staff were approved for exemptions. And Klamath County Schools says 237 out of 896 employees were granted exemptions. That's 26 percent. Both Medford and Ashland School Districts say they accepted every exemption request from staff. Some hopeful news in the fight against COVID tonight. Researchers predict Oregon will reach herd immunity by late December. Ashley Korsland talked with the scientists behind the latest data. Ashley, this is hopeful. Yeah, it is, Laurel. OHSU data scientist Dr. Peter Graven says that Oregon could reach herd immunity, at least against the Delta variant, by December 26. They can get pretty specific. So to reach that threshold, 85% of the population either has to be vaccinated or develop natural immunity through a COVID infection. At that point, the virus would not be able to spread as quickly anymore. So overall, COVID cases in Oregon have trended downward since early September. And even though the strain on hospitals is starting to ease, Dr. Graven says that more than a fifth of people in the state are still vulnerable to infection. He predicts another 177,000 infections before the state reaches herd immunity in December. I would estimate probably around 700 deaths, in fact. And so, um, you know, that to me is not not really a relief. That's going to be more people that are going to have to go through this. Yeah, so we still have to be cautious. Now, at this point, Dr. Graven says there is nothing to suggest a surge in a new variant, but that could change at any time. So they're keeping their eyes on that. It's also important just to keep following those safety protocols like wearing masks and getting vaccinated. Now, I'll be taking a closer look at this issue coming up tonight on the story at six o'clock. That is hopeful, but also sobering talking yeah. about all those deaths still to come. Thank you, Ashley. We'll look forward to more at six o'clock. The pandemic is impacting staffing at school districts across the state. In Beaverton, they're now offering cash incentives. Christine Pitawanich has more on efforts to fill hundreds of jobs. The Beaverton School District, along with many others, is dealing with substantial staffing shortages. Take transportation, for example. Is every administrator, every supervisor, every dispatcher and mechanic are actually, those who can, are running bus routes every day. Um, that works in the short term, but that also means that they're not doing their jobs as administrators, supervisors, mechanics, and dispatchers. So it's a short-term solution. It is not a long-term solution. That's why Shelly Bailey Shaw, spokesperson for the district, says they are offering a $500 incentive for people who choose to stay and new hires signing on to fill shortages in certain categories. We need people to fill full-time positions. Roles include bus drivers, nutrition services, custodians, paraeducators, school office assistants, and substitutes for those positions. In total, there are more than 550 openings, and that doesn't include the need for licensed substitute teachers, who, by the way, are not eligible for the incentive. It would have to be negotiated with the teachers union. And, you know, nationwide, there's a shortage of substitutes. We hired a lot of teachers this summer, six, 700 teachers, and we pulled from our substitute pool to fill a lot of those positions. Staffing shortages have been an issue in the past, but the pandemic seems to have made it worse. Retired people, for instance, who might be at higher risk for COVID may have normally signed up to be a substitute or bus driver before, but now aren't coming back. Regarding safety, Bailey Shaw says only 1.1% of the roughly 40,000 students in the district are quarantining with positive or presumptive positive COVID. We have four staff members who are COVID positive or presumptive. And that's, you know, in a workforce of 4,600. And if you're wondering whether the governor's vaccine mandate that went into effect this week impacted staffing numbers, Bailey Shaw says there were only seven full-time employees who did not comply with the mandate and are on unpaid leave. And only one of them is a teacher. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News.